Welcome everyone uh, back to our morning session. Uh, I won't repeat the whole spiel I just did. Um, so our first speaker today is uh, Professor Darren York from Rutgers University. Uh, he's currently a distinguished uh, professor and Henry Rutgers University chair um, in the Rutgers uh, Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, the Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine, and the director of the Rutgers Laboratory for Biomolecular Simulation Research. Um, he uh, did his postdoc with Martin Karplus at Harvard in multi-scale modeling uh, and is uh, and with uh, Wei Tao Yang at Duke uh, in linear scale and DFT and his PhD with Lee Peterson at UNC Chapel Hill um, in particle mesh Ewald methods for biomolecular simulations. Um, just a couple awards uh, uh, that he asked me to mention. The uh, 2014, he was the 2014 US Professor of the Year in the state of New Jersey uh, by the Council for Advancement and Support of Education and the Carnegie Foundation. Um, and the 2020 Grossman Innovation Prize for Novel Methods in Drug Discovery. Um, so let me stop uh, sharing the schedule here. So uh, Darren, please uh, kick us off. Sounds good. Well, let's see. So I'm trying to share screen here. And everyone see things okay? So. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a delight to, to be able to be at this talk and, and listen to all these uh, fantastic uh, methodological developments and applications. Um, I'm actually really excited to be here to, to uh, talk in front of all of you and hopefully um, maybe give you a little bit of a sense of what some of the biological applications that we're working on, how they have some interesting challenges and their super interesting problems and kind of what our strategy is moving forward to use deep learning to try and advance the state of the art. Um, so I wanted to start by just giving, a, giving you a little preview of, of what a, a, a small uh, simulation might look like for, for uh, one of the smallest types of RNA enzymes. This is called a hammerhead ribozyme. Typically, they put these systems uh, of, uh, of you know, a couple thousand atoms into a big box of water, about 30, 50,000 atoms. And what we're seeing is, is we're zooming in on what's called the active site of the enzyme. So this is where all the chemistry sort of plays out. So when we end up doing simulations, uh, looking at uh, the enzymatic mechanism for some of these biomolecules, typically we're looking uh, at a region of about this size that we need to treat quantum mechanically, but as important as that is, is to be able to treat the rest of the environment. So I kind of wanted to just give a little bit of a sense of, of, of what that, that scope and scale kind of is, because that might differentiate a little bit of what, uh, of what we do than, than what uh, was talked about a little bit yesterday. So to give an idea, a typical uh, RNA enzyme active site. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about applications today uh, to RNA catalysis, how molecules of RNA are able to catalyze chemical reactions. Typically these active sites uh, contain about 50 to 200 atoms or so. And again, that's where chemistry is gonna play out. And so that's where we need a quantum mechanical and or machine learning model. Uh, now, the size of an RNA enzyme itself is typically on the order of 1500 to 3000 atoms. When we put these together in a simulation, typically the surrounding solvent is 95% of the system. That ranges from about 30,000 to 60,000 atoms, typically for these systems. Once we establish this sort of spatial scale, then we get into a sampling problem. Uh, so typically a single molecular dynamic simulation to simulate a single state of the system usually is around 10 nanoseconds and using a one femtosecond time step, that's about 10 million time steps. So 10 million evaluations of the energy and forces for one simulation. Now we don't want to actually simulate just one state of the system. Usually what we want to do is map out a free energy surface. And you can think about a free energy surface as kind of being a, a type of map where every sort of pixel on that map has to represent a separate simulation. So typically we're looking at on the order of a thousand or more of these MD simulations. So that translates into about a billion energy and force evaluations for a system uh, on the order of 50,000 atoms. And if each one of these energy and force evaluations only took a second on a multi, you know, let's say a multi uh, core compute node, uh, and suppose we are running a thousand of these things simultaneously, it would take over three months to complete. Now we don't have any computational resources that allow us to do that routinely. Although if any of you do, I can give you an email to send me a secret message and we can talk about that. But Typically, we need to get the energy and force evaluations for these 50,000 atom systems a lot faster than even a second uh, on, on a multi-core node. Um, 
So that's kind of the scale of what we need to do. Now let's talk a little bit about what, uh, what means sort of uh, things to be of the accuracy level needed for biological applications. So typically when we're measuring rates, uh, rates are proportional uh, to, to the, the activation free energy divided by the thermal temperature, KVT. And uh, so in here in the States, you know, we're, we're, we're fairly challenged with respect to units as it is, uh, but to kind of normalize things, chemists are even more so. Uh, we tend to use units that, that are on the scales of things that we look at. And so thermal temperature at 298K, which is, you know, roughly where, where, where life happens, uh, is about, you know, 0.0095 Hartree's, about 0.026 EVs, 2.5 kilojoules per mole, or in the chemistry units, about 0.59 kcals per mole. So a kcal per mole is, is, uh, is you know, 1 627th of a Hartree. You know, kind of get a sense of what a kcal per mole is. Think about, you know, taking a thimble, putting about 20 drops of water in it, and then uh, maybe taking a lighter and heating up that, that one gram of water by one degree of Celsius, and that will give you uh, a calorie. Um, the number of kilocalories per mole required to unfold an entire protein is on the order of 10 or 20. That translates into, uh, you know, three or four hydrogen bonds and uh, only 1.4 kcals per mole is the energy required to, to reduce or increase the rate of an enzyme by a factor of 10. So we're looking at really big systems, many, many confirmations, and then at the end of the day, trying to figure out tiny, tiny little energies. That's sort of the scope of what we're doing. Um, and so it kind of requires some specialized methods in order to do that. So here's kind of the general strategy. So what we're going to do is we're going to model the non-reacting part of the systems, which is most of the system. Uh, and we're going to model those interactions for the parts that contain either well-studied solvent molecules or well-studied biopolymer building blocks. So the proteins and the nucleic acids and the water molecules and the ions, all of that stuff has evolved over 30 years of force field development. And as long as those things aren't reacting, those well-defined building blocks can, can be uh, well modeled using highly tuned molecular mechanical force fields. And those are super fast because they're super simple. But they contain empiricism that allows you to get experimental results as long as you don't ask them too much. So we'll model the reactive parts for enzyme design uh, or the molecules for which we do not have an accurate force field, like in drug discovery, where, where maybe the molecules that you're looking at haven't even ever been synthesized yet. So fast, uh, so accurate force fields don't exist. We're going to model them with quantum mechanical force fields, which I'll describe in a minute, and then kind of correct their accuracy using range corrected deep potentials. Okay, so this method has advantages that the majority of the system is going to be treated by these extremely fast models, whereas only a relatively small part on the order of 50 to 200 atoms are going to be treated with a specialized quantum mechanical force field with deep learning corrections. So, so by design, because we're building uh, a model based on what's going to be a very fast approximate level of quantum theory, we already have electrostatics built in. We already have changes in charge state and, and spin state uh, taken into account. Uh, also, uh, other types of processes, bond breaking and formation. Uh, but the accuracy is not quite where we need it to be. That's where the deep learning potentials are going to come in. And as was mentioned yesterday, uh, using DeepMD Kit, there's a lot of advantages for the type of neural networks that are used in terms of being size extensive and symmetry preserving and smooth and differential, so on and so forth, needed for molecular simulations. So now let's talk a little bit about what the heck do I mean by a quantum mechanical force field? In essence, a quantum mechanical force field is a flavor of linear standard electronic structure theory, uh, where there is some recourse into replacing what are normally orbital orbital interactions uh, with density functionals. So it becomes, there is a level of empiricism. That's what makes the quantum mechanical method not a pure linear scaling electronic structure method, but one that we, we claim as a force field. Um, these tunable density functionals, which, which uh, take into account, for example, molecules bumping into one another, uh, exchange repulsions and things that occur between non-bonded interactions. Um, those can be tuned so that the force fields are very, very accurate. Now, what we're gonna do, so just to give you a sense, if we compare uh, uh, 
a, a um, hybrid density functional at a reasonable basis set. The types of approximate quantum mechanical models, semi-empirical flavors of models like density functional type binding theory or, or uh, um, neglect, neglect of diatomic differential overlap methods are typically on the order of about a thousand times faster. Um, and that's in their sort of uh, generic flavor. When you turn them into quantum mechanical force fields where you fragment the system, which I'm gonna explain in a minute, they run anywhere from 10 to a thousand times faster than that. So they're actually comparable to, to the to computational cost of running a neural network. Maybe a little bit slower, but not much, not more, by, not more than a factor of, of five or so. So what is a quantum mechanical force field within in the context that I'm describing? So the idea behind a quantum mechanical force field is you're going to fragment the system into, into interacting fragments that are, have only limited connections by covalent bonds. And you're gonna replace this generalized eigenvalue problem and, and uh, fairly non-sparse matrix into one that's uh, block diagonal, where you have different block diagonal Hamiltonians that replace the orbital orbital overlap interactions with density functions. Um, what you can also do is because the, the, the approximate quantum models that we use have a full single particle density matrix, we can, we can choose to, to express that electrostatic interaction uh, in a way that's different when we, when we communicate electrostatics to other molecules than what we do internally. So here's an example of, of what the electrostatic potential difference map looks like between a third order density functional type binding method and, uh, and uh, an ab initio density functional. And uh, basically the red and uh, blue colors represent large differences in the electrostatic potential. And anywhere that you see green means the difference is very close to zero. So green is good, red and blue are bad. Here's what happens when we do the, the, the multipole remapping of the single particle density matrix in order to best reproduce an ab initio uh, uh, electrostatic potential. So the top row actually shows sort of the same calculation uh, using density functional type binding theory, but within a quantum mechanical force field framework. So we get better electrostatics out of it, uh, which is gonna be important. Um, also, uh, just, to, just to get back to, to some electrostatics, um, here's an example of chlorobenzene, just to give a little bit uh, of an example of how electrostatics oftentimes cannot be modeled very well by, by representing uh, electrostatics as point charges or point uh, monopoles that live on top of atom centers. To give you a sense, density functional type binding theory uses this type of monopolar model. So, so chlorobenzene has a couple of things. If we look at the bottom left, this is a, a, an isocontour of electrostatic potential that illustrates uh, some of the electrostatic potential above and below the ring that are due to, to uh, pi bonds. And also around the chlorine, there's something called a sigma hole, which is, which is related to, to the, the halogen lone pairs that are difficult to model with, with atom-centered point charges. In fact, if you go to point mo monopoles uh, or point quadrupoles, they both give kind of lousy uh, uh, isocontours of electrostatic potential. You actually need to have Gaussian quadrupoles in order to effectively um, mimic this type of electrostatic potential signature. So electrostatics are important and it's very important for, for not only catalysis, but drug discovery. Um, I'm just going to mention in passing that uh, that long range electrostatics needs to be treated carefully when you start to mix these ab initio or, or semi empirical quantum models with molecular mechanical models. And there's a method called the ambient potential composite evolved method, which is a linear scaling method that can be used for this type of calculation. And it's a it's a technical detail that that doesn't really affect the, the overall context of this talk, but I'm going to mention it because it is an important uh, um, development to have stable um, types of, of electrostatic interactions. But I won't dwell on that. I will move on and, and basically say our, our first generation quantum mechanical force fields, we were able to train with respect to condensed phase properties uh, where we looked at, at things like water uh, and were able to get bulk properties as well as, as sort of cluster properties at the same time. Now, um, because this is sort of, so this is a, a regression that, that kind of shows that, uh, that we can also get clusters uh, where, where traditional molecular mechanical models cannot, um, in addition to bulk properties. 
But this is an example with water. There's tons known about water, and we can cheat a lot by training parameters to be able to match experimental results. In the, in the examples that I'm gonna talk about next, catalysis uh, and drug discovery, we don't have that option. And so we need to take a, a little bit of a different tact. Um, I also kind of wanted to give you a sense of uh, kind of the, the speed of the quantum mechanical force fields. Let me see if I can start this again. Um, this is an example of a self-consistent field procedure uh, using a density functional type binding model on a small protein system. So this is sped up by a factor of 60. And every time you see a color change is one step of the SCF cycle. So basically one second is a, is a minute and each one of these is an iteration. And this is about a 2000 atom system or so. So this is what happens when we treat the entire protein using density functional type binding theory. A self-consistent field calculation takes about eight minutes. If we were to do the same thing using our quantum mechanical force field, again, for a whole 2000 atom system, which normally we won't do, Normally we only treat 50 to 200 atoms, but just to give you a timing result, this is what it looks like. It takes about half a second, and that's in real time. So this is, you know, this is a factor of, you know, approximately 600 speed up with respect to to uh, the, the non-quantum mechanical force field version of this. So we have a very fast quantum model, but it's approximate. And so, so now uh, I'm going to pause for a second and tell you a little bit about a biological problem that motivated the design of one of our first generation machine learning models. Um, so before I show you the training of that model, I want to give you a little bit of an appreciation of the actual reaction that's occurring. It's a reaction that's catalyzed by RNA, which sort of was the subject of two Nobel Prizes uh, in 1989 and 2009. And also it's the subject of a lot of new uh, pharmaceutical companies, including new startup companies that look towards uh, um, actually targeting uh, RNAs as, as uh, therapeutic targets. Um, to remind folks about the biology, uh, RNA molecules are built up from four fundamental building blocks that are essentially non-reactive. So it's a fundamental chemical question about how these inherently kind of inert and limited building blocks can assemble into three-dimensional structures that can all of a sudden accelerate the rate of important chemical reactions by over 10 million folds. Um, so here's the reaction that we're gonna look at. In short, this is a reaction that simply involves the cleavage of an RNA backbone, okay? So it's a, a reaction where a big molecule of RNA gets cleaved or ligated is the reverse process. So this is very important, uh, not only in transcription uh, and translation, but also in, in uh, gene expression uh, and in different types of cell signaling. So it's a super important ubiquitous reaction in, in biology. And this is the one that, that we, we are sort of targeting. Um, as, a, as a fundamental reaction that's catalyzed by RNA enzymes. Uh, RNA enzymes, when they cleave, uh, when they undergo what's called self-cleavage, this is actually something that, that viruses do. So when a virus wants to replicate, uh, it uses what's called a rolling circle mechanism where it hijacks the cellular machinery that, that uh, allows the nucleic acid material to be replicated and it forms a circle. And so it keeps on going around and around and around, replicating this big, long, concatenated piece of genetic material. And then what it does is it programs in uh, sort of a self-cleaving pair of scissors that when uh, a certain sequence of RNA gets synthesized, it will cleave it, it'll auto-cleave itself so that each one of these viral genomes can go and be packaged up and, and the, the virus can undergo a very efficient lytic cycle. Um, here's an example of an RNA enzyme that we studied called the twister ribosome, uh, where we conducted a, a quantum mechanical investigation that, that was uh, uh, published about a year ago. But just to give you an idea of what this uh, reaction actually looks like in an RNA system. So we're going to have a, a, a nucleophile that's over here that's going to get lined up to make an inline attack to this phosphorus. And then uh, first it's going to be activated by what's called a general base. So a proton gets plucked off and then this activated nucleophile attacks this phosphorus and then the leaving group ends up leaving and now all of a sudden we have a cleaved piece of RNA. So that's the reaction. So let's, uh, and, and in order to map out the mechanism, we need to, to elucidate the entire free energy surface. 
So we need to map out the, the, the reaction free energy as a function of the intrinsic uh, reaction variables, which might, for example, be a progress variable associated to the general base that deprotonates the proton, progress variable associated with the actual phosphoryl transfer reaction. And if there's an acid involved, a uh, progress variable that involves the, the general acid donation of a proton. Um, so this requires a whole set of simulations to explore different parts of that map. Okay. All right. So now let's get into deep learning. So, so the idea is at the ab initio level, we just can't afford in any way, shape, or form to do the uh, amount of sampling required using an ab initio density functional model. Um, at least, so so. Uh, what I mean by that is we can't actually solve the equations of motion where we have to take little tiny one femtosecond time steps and then do that 10 million times and then a thousand times over, okay? So so the idea is, is we need a much faster model, uh, but one that still gets us the accuracy level of an ab initio method. So when we started out this, this process, we first wanted to say, okay, how do we, how do we train a model in a robust way uh, such that we can apply this method to some initial data? And the idea here is we're probably not going to be able to afford to actually fully validate the model using the initial data because it's too, it's too expensive. So uh, as a first step, what we did is we played a game where we took two very different approximate semi-empirical models. Uh, one was a density functional type binding theory and one was a NEDO based method, uh, which are quite different in terms of their properties, their electrostatic properties and their conformational properties. Uh, and we asked the question, could we train a deep learning model so that we could get one, one of those methods to look like the other and vice versa? in a robust way. And the reason why we used both of these semi-empirical models is we could actually afford to, to do the full calculations so that in the end, we could see whether we were right or not, okay? The goal of this though, was to create a procedure that we could then apply to an app to train uh, 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 the same model against ab initio data where we wouldn't have the luxury of being able to fully validate it. So to make a long story short, um, one of the one of the first things that that uh, I have a very uh, uh, talented um, graduate student in my group, uh, Jinju Zhang, uh, who's one of the, the MD developers, and uh, and he developed a, a range correction, which enabled not only the, the the QM QM interaction within the active site uh, to have a deep learning potential correction, but also the, the interaction of that QM region with the molecular mechanical atoms uh, would be a different neural network that would smoothly go to zero within what we call a non-bonded cutoff. And so, so uh, non-bonded cutoffs are used in molecular dynamics programs in order to evaluate non-bonded interactions. Electrostatics are treated a little bit differently, but part of the electrostatics are, are contained in a non-bonded cutoff. But this would enable uh, a, a seamless implementation using non-bonded list and its integration into AMBER. So we integrated all this into AMBER, uh, including the range correction, the range correction and we uh, explored its use um, uh, in terms of training the model. I might mention, this wasn't the first thing that we tried. In fact, the first thing that we tried was without a range correction and we couldn't get good results. The reason why we couldn't get good results is because the electrostatic interactions between these two models that we were trying to train were actually quite different. So we needed to correct more than just the QM-QM interactions. We needed to, to also train the QM-MM interactions in order for the two models to agree. So in the end, we looked at these model reactions. So this is the same reaction that I just showed you before in the context of the ribosome environment, but here it's in, not in the context of the ribosome environment. This is a non-enzymatic model that occurs in the solution. And we also looked at, at a bunch of variations of this reaction where we replace certain oxygen with sulfurs. So actually that's a common uh, thing that experimentalists do in order to probe mechanistically what's going on with these reactions. So these sulfur substitutions are often performed uh, in mechanistic studies experimentally, which is why we chose this series. To make a long story short, uh, we, we first 
uh, identify the, 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 the need for the model to have a range direction, and we explored different distance criterions. And it turned out that, that for these models, uh, within six angstroms was sort of the sweet spot in terms of that gave us a quantitatively accurate model. Going to nine angstroms uh, didn't do much, uh, much more. Uh, going to three angstroms, though, was quite a bit worse. And so we, we chose a six angstrom cutoff uh, for our, our range, deep learning range correction. And what this shows, these are free energy profiles. So, so uh, we trained these models with respect to energies and forces. There were no free energies explicitly in the training. And yet what I'm showing you here are free energy surfaces, one dimensional free energy curves, uh, corresponding to the reactions of all six of these different models. Um, so what you end up seeing is the thing to kind of uh, look at here, we're comparing active learning with no active learning. So we talked, we heard a little bit about what active learning means uh, 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 yesterday. Uh, and here active learning made a big difference in the way we we're able to train the models. And in the end, uh, we left out two of the models. One of the things I want you to kind of notice, um, if you compare red and black, those are the two models. So the idea is we're basically trying to get the, the, the model in black with a correction to look like the one in red, okay? Uh, and so, so one of the things I want you to notice is that the black and red curves are oftentimes really a lot different. There's not like minor changes. They're like fundamentally different reaction profile. So this is a really stringent test if you can get a machine learning model to make one of these models into a much, much different model. Uh, and so, so we developed an active learning training procedure that, that was able to do this uh, across all six uh, um, reactions where we actually trained the model with respect to four and even the two that we didn't train turned out to be pretty good. Um, to give a little bit of a sense of, uh, you know, what the speed involved is, is uh, if you look at the, the black bars, the black bars are the computational time uh, required uh, when we don't have any machine learning correction. So this is just doing QMMM with our quantum mechanical force fields, okay? The green lines uh, uh, correspond to the CPU implementation of uh, DeepMD kit and our interface and when we add the machine learning correction. So actually it's, uh, it's pretty expensive. It's more expensive than the quantum mechanical force, force field model when we run it on CPUs. When we run it on GPUs, however, uh, it's tremendously faster. And in fact, this is only, uh, only about less than 10% of, uh, of the overhead with respect to the fundamental quantum mechanical force field model. So that's good, run it on GPUs and, and uh, it really doesn't uh, cost much more. So then we apply this model uh, to, to train uh, uh, DFTB3, uh, DFTB2 model to, to a uh, ab initio density functional, here it's PBE0. And um, the, the DFTB2 model is shown in green and the PBE0 model is shown in black and after we apply this procedure to training it, uh, the, the, the DFTB2 plus DPRC, which is shown in red, is, is very, very close uh, to the free energy profiles corresponding to each one of those reactions. Um, and the computational cost uh, represents a factor of about 200 times speed up with respect to PBE0 calculations. Um, uh, and well, 200 X speed up where the PBE zero calculations is actually required more cores than, uh, than uh, the, the DPRC model. So um, we get good performance and good accuracy. And another thing we, I wanted to mention, just in terms of application, oftentimes when you look at enzymatic reactions, uh, one of the experimental probes that are used to characterize the structure and bonding of the transition state is to measure so-called kinetic isotope effects. So kinetic isotope effects uh, are nuclear quantum effects that we can actually compute using uh, uh, ring polymer path integral molecular dynamics. So we created an additional interface between deep MD kit, Amber, and uh, uh, the IPI software, uh, which allowed us to have access to, to interesting methods like the piglet thermostat, which requires a minimum number of, uh, of uh, uh, 
beads associated with the ring polymers, and we're able to compute um, kinetic isotope effects in order to, to aid in the interpretation of experimental measurements. So we have experimental collabor collaborators that actually measure kinetic isotope effects for some of our systems, and now we're able to, to uh, help interpret them in terms of structure and bonding of the transition state. Um, okay. So that kind of concludes uh, what, what uh, I wanted to talk about with respect to, to the enzyme catalysis. I just wanna show one more slide, two more slides that uh, are some preliminary results that Jinsi has given me uh, with respect to the development of our drug discovery model. So I'm not gonna get into details about uh, um, how we actually perform drug discovery calculations. So I'm just gonna skip over that. Um, this is uh, called a bookending approach, and I'm not going to talk about it. What I will talk about is that Jinsi uh, extended the uh, implementation of the training procedure such that the loss function uh, that was being trained could also take into account relative energies, uh, which are important in order to establish context for things like um, different uh, protonation states, different tautomer equilibrium, and things of that nature, where these molecules, it's not just relative energy is subtracting two things, you actually have to do geometry optimizations at each state, at each point. So every time you come up with a new neural network, you have to go through these things, geometry optimized, takes differences in energy, and have that enter the loss function. And so here, I just want to show a preliminary result. This is my last slide, I promise, uh, where, where um, I want you to take a look at, uh, you know, what's one of the most popular pure uh, machine learning models out there right now for drug discovery. It's called the NE2X model. That's in orange. Uh, and I'm going to compare that to, to a couple of other models, DFTB3, which is density functional type binding theory, uh, uh, another neural network trained uh, model with dispersion called DFN1XTB uh, by Stefan Grimma, uh, and, uh, and our new sort of um, DPRC model, which is based on, on DFTB3 plus machine learning model. So the first thing that you see is, is the pure machine learning model, the NE2X. It doesn't know anything about, that's all it knows about is, is the identity of elements and their positions. It has no idea what charge is, it has no idea what spin state is. And so when you start uh, uh, changing your charge state by pulling off protons, it, it becomes a big mess. And so that's what these outlier points are, are, are shown here. It really can't handle those situations at all. And it turns out the other model doesn't do very well either. Um, so if you look at, uh, at, at this, the, these look like they're kind of along the lines of, uh, of uh, th this line, but they're, they're many kcals per mole off, which uh, uh, I hope I convinced you, you know, even being one kcal per mole off is not a good thing. And so uh, we're actually able to get quantitative accuracy. You know, we have mean absolute errors you know, on the order of 0.1 kcal per mole. For, for these tautomers and for these relative protonation energies, uh, where the next best model is four kcals per mole. So we're really encouraged by this. We need to test it more. We need to have a lot of stuff to do, but I wanted to give kind of a shout out, shout out to, to some of uh, Ginger's work and, uh, and, and keep you all posted that I think we're gonna have some exciting advances with this model moving forward. And so uh, I've had the privilege to work with a fantastic group and here the work, uh, the main work was done by Tim Giese, uh, Shalen Ekeson, and, uh, and Jinsi uh, Zeng, who I've mentioned a couple times before. Uh, they're all a great group of people. We have a great set of collaborators, and I really appreciate uh, all of you for your attention. Thanks so much, Professor York, uh, for sharing this really exciting uh, area of uh, deep learning and molecular simulation. Um, I think we're just going to have maybe time for one question that was uh, put in the Q&A uh, about a minute ago, um, and I think actually this is uh, several questions. Um, maybe let's uh, tackle the, the first of, of these, and then if you don't mind answering yeah, sure. uh, uh, by typing. So, so hi, Dr. York. How do you couple the QMFF plus DPRC region with the MM region? Is it similar to coupling in a typical QMFF? QMMM simulation? Yep, that's a great question. And the answer is, is um, basically the QMFF and the MM is just like QMMM with a minor difference that, uh, that the actual multipoles that are used in the QMFF are derived from the, the single particle density matrix of the DFTB3 method, but we have some multiple mapping parameters uh, that, that uh, are, are basically, remember, density functional type binding only gives you monopoles on the atom center, even though it has a, a, a full single particle density matrix. 
So we actually use that single particle density matrix to put uh, multipoles on the atoms so that the multipoles can be felt by the MM atoms, which also have partial charges. So that's how we treat that interaction. And then the DPRC only makes a, a, a short and mid-range correction uh, with the, the uh, two MMM interactions out to six angstroms. Fantastic. Thanks so much again. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In the interest of time, I think we'll uh, have to move on, um, if you don't mind.